got four minutes. We'll start with all the jump. Real, open up. Welcome to all. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for another beautiful Sabbath afternoon. We invite your presence to be with us in this meeting, in the director of this meeting. Lord, we find ourselves in the midst of a fast-moving COVID-19. We are learning something new about this virus weekly. We're asking that you will give your peace, love, and grace to this world, to this country, and to our church. Bless and give wisdom to our panel this afternoon so that we can understand the truth of what we are facing during this COVID-19 season. Bless all who are making sacrifices and keeping us safe. Those who are those who are working to supply the goods we need, doctors, nurses, first responders, law enforcement, all medical workers, educators, and all the works behind the scene in our conference administration, amen. Our purpose today is to take a closer look at COVID-19 because 
there are a lot of bad and false information all around us. Today, we have a panel made up of Adventist professionals to look at and to answer questions and to answer questions from you throughout the conference. We welcome you again. May the Lord bless. At this time, I'd like to present our moderator, Elder David Smith, Executive Secretary of the South Atlantic Conference. I say thank you. Thank you, Elder Jones. Elder Jones is our Health Ministries Director for our conference, and we certainly do appreciate his department working within our conference to help to organize this along with others to bring it to you today. COVID-19 and uh, the church, learn, understand, and comprehend. As he has said today, we have a distinguished panel of professionals who are going to share their knowledge and their wisdom with us to help us during this time of pandemic. Along with them, we do have the president of our conference, Elder William Winston, who is present virtually. We're certainly glad to have you, Mr. President. If you want to take a minute or two now, just give some opening statements. Uh, president, Elder William Winston. Thank you, Elder Smith, and good afternoon to each of you, and thank you to our panel. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a town hall and, and basically focused on the church and reopening churches and all, and almost immediately, uh, we were asked, could we do a follow-up on that? Uh, we thought that the follow-up would be best done by medical experts, and we are so delighted to have uh, this team with us today. Uh, there's so much information. I, I encourage you to get a pen and a pencil and a pad beside you to take notes, because there's some things you're going to hear that you might want to uh, keep for later or follow-up questions. We, we will do the best we can today to stay on point. Uh, we, we set aside 90 minutes. But with all of this information and, and medical acumen, uh, we're going to do our best to do that. There are ways to get questions in. Uh, I think we have uh, some information on that. You'll hear about it later. But thank you for being here. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Uh, this virus is not a respect of persons. Thank you for all of our doctors who are with us today. We appreciate it very much. And Elder Smith, thank you for moderating. Man, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. As was said earlier by our IT director, Dr. James Lamb, we had a little bit of a problem with our server. So some of the questions that were sent in early, we do not have, but we have a way, but you can send in questions. The call-in number is 678-434-0321. Six seven eight four three four zero three four three. If you would like to text in your questions to that number, we can do our best to get them up and to ask them on today. I want to take a moment to introduce our panel. And after I introduce them, then we're going to go through and allow each one of them to take um, a few minutes to share with us um, particulars about the pandemic as it relates to their state. From the state of North Carolina, we have Dr. Richard Berry. From the state of South Carolina, we have Dr. David Grant. From the state of Georgia, we have Dr. Tracy C. Wallace. And then we have two doctors in the mental health field. We have Dr. La Nina Mompromier, and we have Dr. Sanders Mompromier, who are in the medical field. I'm not the medical field, but the mental health field, and they will respond accordingly. So I'm going to ask each one of our panelists if you would take uh, three to five minutes or so, and share with us specifics uh, about the pandemic in your state, beginning first with Dr. Richard Berry. Thank you so much, Pastor. I've been asked, first of all, to talk about the virus itself, where just like we're in a spiritual warfare, we are at war with the virus, an enemy we cannot see. We need to become familiar with this virus because it is going to kill us if we don't get familiar with it. The virus is called SARS-CoV-2. That's a virus, SARS-CoV-2. The disease that it caused is called COVID-19. CO means uh, coronavirus, corona, VI is virus, D is disease, and 19 is the year that it was discovered, 2019. It's a novel or new virus. The virus is from a class of uh, RNA viruses called zoonotic viruses. These are viruses that usually infect animals to humans or humans to animals. 
if you take an electron microscope and look at each virus, the virus is surrounded by a corona or a crown that looks like a halo. That's where it gets the name coronavirus from it. The virus is 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 microns in diameter. That's very small. If you take a millimeter ruler and look at millimeter one and two and divide it into 1,000 equal spaces, that's the size of the coronavirus. That is why it's important to use masks that have N95 because this mask here has holes that are 0 0.05 microns. So anything bigger than 0 0.05 microns won't get through this. Um, it is transmitted through the respiratory droplets that we breathe in, aerosols. Have you ever been in the bathroom after your wife has used her hairspray and she has left, but you go back inside and you find that you still smell the hairspray? Those are aerosols that stay in the air. The virus is so light and small that it stays, it stays in the air for a, con for a long period of time. Therefore, you walk into a room that somebody has coughed in, you can breathe in these aerosols. It's transmitted by a droplet. The virus has little finger-like projections that catch onto the cell and a cell receptor is called the ACE receptor. That's very important for African-Americans. And if I get a chance, I'll talk about ACE receptors in regards to um, African-Americans and um, high blood pressure. It grabs onto this ACE, it's called ACE2 receptor. It opens up the cell, the virus RNA goes inside the cell, multiplies and more viruses are produced. It, the ACE receptors are found in the lungs, the um, heart, the kidneys, and also in the gut. In North Carolina, we have, as of sunset on Friday, a good number, 144,000. It sounds prophetic. 144,000 people have been infected with the virus, and 2,370 people have died because of the virus. Schools are being open. We're in phase two now of opening schools and um, churches. Churches can be open, but you can have more, have more than 25 people in there if it's um, inside. Outside, no more than 10 people. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Uh, Dr. David Grant? Yes, sir. Need to unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Grant, can you unmute yourself? I think you're still on mute. Okay, you, you, you can hear me? Okay, I am going to uh, start with some South Carolina information and perhaps later I'll be able to get to where how it impacted my practice in the anesthesia, but I'm simply going to start with information from South Carolina. I, I to get into that, I kind of a segue into that. What I'd like to say is, uh, especially for Adventists in general, we should certainly be concerned with uh, prevention from uh, our lifestyle choices, as outlined in. Uh, Ministry of Healing and the writings of Ellen G. White about the eight health principles of rest, exercise, diet, fresh air, water, abstinence, sunlight, and of course, trust in God. I certainly advocate wearing of masks, social distancing, and hand washing. And when uh, that's not possible, then using hand sanitizer. Uh, the only thing we really have this to, to compare this to is what happened about 100 years ago. That was the pandemic of 1918 through 1920, the Spanish flu. Uh, it was a worldwide phenomenon that affected about 500 million people. It then, uh, the estimates are all over the place, but it's safe to say around 50 million people died worldwide from that pandemic. Uh, Specifically talking about South Carolina, we know today in the U.S. we're over 5 million uh, cases and the number of deaths is over 166,000. In South Carolina, our number of cases is 105,000. Our deaths are over 2,200. We have, um, as you might expect, the hot spots in the state are the population centers. Starting with Greenville, the largest city, Charleston, and Columbia. These have the largest numbers of cases. In South Carolina, the director of uh, our epidemiologist is Dr. Linda Bell, who happens to be a, a, a lady of color. But she is the epidemiologist for, in our state, it's referred to as DHEC, 
It stands for Department of Health and Environmental Control. So that is, that's our cases. Right now, 77% of the people tested in South Carolina have been negative and 23, oh, well, I'll put it this way, let me back up. 77% of the people uh, that tested positive did not need to be hospitalized by the criteria established. Uh, 23% did. Uh, the largest numbers of deaths in South Carolina are from those 71 and older. They, they account for 70% of the deaths. 60% uh, of all cases are in the older group, uh, 61 and over. The youngest recorded case in South Carolina, so we can know that it's not simply a case, a situation of older people, was two months that tested positive. And the oldest that tested positive was 101. Uh, the youngest person to die from it in the state was 35 years old. The oldest was 98. Uh, according to the CDC, as much as 80% of people that have COVID uh, are asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it. They don't, they don't experience any, any symptoms. 15% have severe symptoms and about five require ventilatory support. They need to be on a ventilator in the hospital. Uh, by sex in South Carolina, the majority of women that have COVID, the majority is women. It's about 54% and about 44% men. Uh, but the death rate is just the opposite. More men die of it, about 55%. And women is about 45%. Uh, as far as race is concerned, about 54% of the cases are, are white or Caucasian. 40% of cases are black. 6% are other Native Americans, Asian. Uh, but in the deaths, we are 56% of the deaths in the state of South Carolina. And according to our latest census, we only represent 27% of the population. And I'm gonna use this chance just to get a little personal here. And it's looks like this. That's a, a really terrible statistics. It's because of comorbidities, things like obesity, hypertension, things like, um, oh, uh, diabetes, kidney problems, that kind of thing. I'm gonna run over a little bit from my five minutes. But I just wanna tell you is that I really would encourage, uh, especially the black people in South Carolina to pay more attention to, to your health. We just really need to, because we have, uh, this is a sad statistic, but it's a true one for us. Our schools are starting back on uh, the 8th of September. We are uh, in the midst of varying cycles and sessions from different school districts. Uh, we have, uh, for people who do not have the internet available, you can get it from the public library and they will lend it to you for as long as three weeks. To find out specific information in the state of South Carolina, there's a website. It's Accelerate SC. Accelerate is all uh, lowercase and SC is uppercase. This will give you the latest info, closings and that kind of thing in the state of South Carolina. I do have some additional information, but I want to respect the time limit. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Grant. Dr. Wallace, Dr. Tracy Wallace. Unmute yourself. Yes, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, boy, I'll try to edit some of what I was gonna say, but a thousand Americans, 1,000 Americans have died every day from this virus over the last 18 days. We've never seen anything like this especially during the summer months. This is supposed to be the lowest time that we have for viruses, but yet we're seeing this kind of numbers. A pandemic, we knew a pandemic was coming. The World Health Organization, the CDC, public health officials have been warning about a pandemic for years. The writing was on the wall a long time ago. New viruses have been emerging at a rate we have not seen before. Since the 1970s, over 40 new viruses have come into play here. 
viruses we've never seen about before, the SARS virus, the Zika virus, the Ebola virus, and now COVID-19, just to name a few of the viruses that have come about just over the last 40 years. Why are these viruses happening? Where are they coming from? We've already hinted at it before. Among the different things, they're coming from animals. And why, and what's happening? Well, to put it simple, a lot of times we're, we're not obeying God's laws, plain and simple. Among other things, global warming, the, as populations explode, we're going more into the displacing animals from their natural environment. Animals, different species are being put close together. Animals that should never have been close together are being put together. And human beings, man is consuming animals that God never intended for us to consume. This has led to viruses jumping from one species to another, and then they mutate, and then we get things like this going on. That, along with global travel, it's nothing for somebody to be in China yesterday and being America today. So within hours, an epidemic anywhere can become an epidemic everywhere or come into be a pandemic like we have right now. So we've known, we've known this was going to happen at some point, and, we, and the public health community has been has been warning about this, but obviously the warnings have been going on deaf ears. Now, a lot of mistakes have been made, and but mistakes are continuing to be made. I represent the state of Georgia, and I'm sure uh, most of you have heard about some of the uh, shenanigans that have been going on in the state of Georgia, such as the uh, governor suing the mayor over the mayor trying to mandate masks. You've probably seen some pictures of going back to school and these schools have been opening and they've been following the White House recommendations. But the White House recommendations state that people are recommended to wear a mask. It's recommended social distancing. They're not requiring that. And so these schools opened up and you saw pictures of these students. They're not social distancing. They're not wearing masks. And School officials are shocked. Oh, what's going on? The virus is popping up. Well, we knew that would happen if you didn't practice these guidelines. So, you know, I've been asked this question and, and, and so many times about what do you do about schools opening? I've been dealing almost on a daily basis with teachers that have been stressed out because they represent that one quarter population of high risk. And they know going back into the classroom, they're at risk. I've even read about some teachers writing their last will and testament just because they're going back to school and they don't know what they are going to be facing. So I have two children, school age. I have decided for our family, my children will be distance learning. Now, that's what works best for me. Personally, if you were to ask me, I think most children should be virtual or distance learning. If you ask me, I would like just those students who physically can't do it. They don't have the, the equipment. They don't have the wherewithal to be online. It's a physical hardship. Those are the students who probably who should go back to the classroom. But the classrooms need to be able to have the social distancing. They should wear a mask at all times. And honestly, ideally, if you're going to do this, ideally, the, the students should be tested. I know that's not that's not feasible, but the students because what happened in Georgia on day one, some students showed up with the virus day one. And again, we know that the children, for the most part, don't have little to no symptoms. And so this is why the virus can come into a school and start to spread so easily, particularly if you're not practicing the other things as well. So in Georgia, we have over 230,000 people that have uh, tested positive for the virus and over 4,600 deaths have occurred uh, so far. Um, this didn't happen. We didn't need 160,000 plus Americans dying. Good leadership could have prevented a lot of these deaths. And I'm gonna say it right here, folks. We need to vote. We need to vote so that we have good leadership. We need to vote for people who will allow and will push for better access to health. We need to push for people who would have better affordability to health. Voting is a political determinant of health. Voting is good for your health. We need to vote like our lives depended on it because in a sense, our lives, our well-being and our health depend on the people that we put to represent us. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. As I said earlier, we have two individuals in the mental health field
and we're going to invite them to share with us uh, some, um, take three to five minutes to share with some particulars of the virus as it relates to mental health. First, we have uh, Dr. La Nina Mompronier. She's a clinical psychologist. So, Dr. Promier, go right ahead. Thank you. Technical difficulty. Thank you, Dave. You and your husband may be too close together. Yeah, need to need oh, to mute one of those, please. One of the, okay. With okay. my husband. <laughs> okay, you good now? He's muted, and when he talks, if you would mute, thank you. Yes, yes, we got it. I think. <laughs> well, hello, I'm Dr. Laninia Montpromier. I am. I'm in private practice here in Georgia. Um, I serve some other states as well um, because I'm an online therapist. Um, and uh, we have, as in the mental health field, have had a, a surge of folks who have been coming in for services. And um, Dr. Wallace already mentioned the teachers who are stressed out. And so I, I know not everybody's familiar with uh, mental health and mental health background. Some people, um, you know, aren't too versed in it. And so I wanted to kind of give us a little bit of a kind of pinpoint of what we're um, looking at when we're talking about mental health as it relates to COVID. So if you could see my screen now, um, there we go. All right. So that's just me. Yes, we can see. Awesome. So I want to talk about your body because we know that the brain is part of the body. And as all in all things with the brain, it really works with different chemicals. So when we have too much stress for too long, then our body starts to have uh, produced too much cortisol. Now we need cortisol when we want to run from the lion, um, but most of us don't see lions on a daily basis. Um, some of us have lions on our job or at our school, or what have you. And those definitely produce some cortisol for us. But cortisol is a steroid hormone that's made by the adrenaline glands and it affects our mood and anxiety levels as well. Um, it also affects your body, as you can see um, the visual that I've given you. So there's different parts of the body that are affected, but it really depletes um, three major brain chemicals that we know are um, really important to brain health and mood, depression, and anxiety. And that's dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, and um, serotonin. And so we want to really control our stress. Well, how do you do that when I've been quarantined for six months? <laughs> that's kind of stressful, right? Um, well, that stress if it's out of control for a persistent long, a, a long time, then it can lead to anxiety and depression. And that's kind of what me and my husband are here to talk to you about, anxiety and depression um, as it relates to, you know, struggling over COVID and all of the things that it, 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 it narrows our life so much. Um, and some of us had some depression and anxiety before, and now we're quarantined and so it's even more worse. So um, anxiety, it's a pers persistent uneasiness. I often get that question like, well, what is anxiety really? Um, and it's that persistent uneasiness, that smoke alarm that goes off to let you know, oh, something ain't right, there's a warning, maybe future risk or problems. Um, but when we have that cortisol pumping in our system and it's depleted those other three brain chemicals that I talked about, then we see that we start to worry more. We start to have more nervousness, more irritability, restlessness, can't sit still, can't get comfortable. Um, some people have full-blown panic attacks. Um, and then others really struggle with depression. And that's that overwhelming sadness that persists for two weeks or more. So I, we've all had sad days. We've all had sad weeks, you know, um, especially if we've really grieved 
over the loss of a loved one, we can kind of relate to what that might feel like. Uh, but depression lasts for more than two weeks and it affects your sleep, your appetite, your memory, concentrate, ability to concentrate, motivation, uh, your motor activity or energy level. It, it, it really um, impacts your feelings. So you're going to feel like guilty, feel worthless, um, feel like there's no reason for you here, um, start having thoughts of death. And some people don't get to the thoughts of death. Some people just have that heavy kind of, uh, I can't do anything right feeling. And, but we want to also pay attention to those that do have those thoughts of death. And nowadays with everybody inside, and you might not have anyone who's able to monitor. So I want, I want to encourage you to call family members and stay connected to people. In addition to that, just some good mental health tips. Don't fight the stress, just relax. So that cortisol um, that's in our body, we want to keep it in a healthy level. And so that means we have to activate our calming nervous system. We have a nervous system that gets us up and when we need to, to react and we have a nervous system that calms us down. And so a lot of us use mu music for that, time and nature. And as um, one of the doctors have already said, we want to get back to that new start. We wanna get back to the principles that our church has been teaching us, uh, time and nature, your spiritual health, your prayer devotion, that helps to kind of balance you out and, and buffer against the stress. Meditation, deep breathing, visualization, and organization, like you need a schedule. You can't just wake up at whatever time and because your schedule is off because of the virus, you need to create a schedule for yourself and for your family. And so I want to encourage everybody to meditate on good things. Remember to schedule your life. Make sure you don't take on too, too much responsibilities. Um, be assertive. Please go back to the eat and diet, eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Look that up, see what, it, what it's about. Exercise, endorphins actually fight against cortisol levels. And so we want, you know, that feel good feeling. Well, if you're feeling in the dumps, if you do a 20 minute workout, you'll feel better afterwards. You might not feel loads better, but you'll feel better afterwards. Sleep is very important. We, um, our body restores itself during sleep. And so as a as a psychologist, as a therapist, I, when people come and work with me, I'm asking about what they eat, how much they sleep, all of these things, because it impacts their stress level. Therefore, it will trigger their depression and their anxiety. We need to make sure we get enough sleep. And finally, ask for help. If any of these around um, are you, describe you, disrupted peace, disrupted sleep. If any of those describe you, try to find some help. Don't stay in the house by yourself. Stop, try to find some help. There's uh, online resources that have um, prepared and I will share this with the conference so that they can share it on their website and Facebook page and such. Um, but I uh, included some mental health resources for folks right here and references and my contact information. So I just want to um, encourage everybody to take care of your mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Promenier. And now Dr. Sanders Promenier, if you would um, take three to five minutes, sir, the floor is yours. All right. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sanders, uh, Dr. Sanders uh, Montpellier. I am uh, uh, on the panel to uh, sort of discuss um, child uh, and adolescent, I guess, uh, stress uh, during these uh, these times. Um, and let me just pause and see if you have my slides. 
Oh, okay. Um, so I'm a child and not adolescent uh, psychiatrist by training. I do see uh, adults, um, but I'll try to limit uh, my focus a little bit more on, like I guess, uh, the children um, here. Now, just in general, everybody uh, reacts to stress uh, and stressful uh, situations differently. That's just, we're all individuals. Um, you know, several folks can uh, experience or witness the same thing and uh, it affects them uh, differently. Now, there are some folks uh, or some people who may be at higher risk of uh, dealing with everything that's been happening uh, around us more, diff they may have a, a more of a challenge are uh, dealing with what's go going on. One of the, one of the groups um, that, that we can think about is older folks. If you have folks who, ha um, and folks with chronic diseases, uh, because from the very beginning of this pandemic, one of the things that uh, you would hear nonstop is, okay, folks with uh, at high, high risk group, you know, they really have to be careful. Well, if that's you, that's all you're hearing every day. It's like, okay, you know, the kids, you know, at least at some point you were hearing, maybe they you know the kids won't be as affected, you know, that's good and well, but everybody, and every time we turn around, they're saying, you are more at risk. Um, you never had um, a, a good footing, uh, I guess, to, to, to start with during, during this whole entire process. Uh, another group would be children um, and teens. Um, and people whose jobs have put them at high risk of being exposed to the virus. And I'm, and I'm not just talking about um, our physicians, our uh, nurses, our healthcare uh, uh, professionals of, you know, different uh, specialties, just the, the folks at the grocery store. You know, as, at least as a physician, you know, we went to school, you somewhat had a sense that part of your job, there was some risk involved to it. Uh, in it, you know, if you if you're a surgeon, you know, you had to you needed to glove up, you need to scrub, you, you know, all that, uh, all those things. Uh, so there was some you went into this with at least some degree of I know I have to be careful, right? I'm not going to be uh, careless. People didn't sign up to um, be a service at McDonald's um, if thinking that they're going to put their life at risk. Um, you know, you're not going to be a grocer at um, your grocery store thinking that this might kill you. You didn't quite sign up. Um, uh, for that. Um, and of course, folks with mental health and that already had pre-existing mental health um, conditions. And in general, some of the things that uh, folks um, can be dealing with are, deal is you have this extra fear and worry about your own health, about the health of the people um, that you care about. Because even if you've all, you yourself are healthy, but you know you have folks in your house, you have folks in your family um, that are vulnerable. You know they have uh, some respiratory disease or, or diabetes. Uh, even 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 if it was just personal to you, um, there was we had we've all had this extra stress that I might um, be the cause of an infection for somebody else. And some things that uh, can affect all of us as we go through stressful um, situations can be like changing the sleep, changing changes in appetite, our concentration uh, can be um, uh, affected, our own health, because, um, you know, we're just on, on constant edge, on constant stress, um, you know, we're not doing the usual things that we um, typically do, uh, you know, I've talked to some folks where, yeah, yeah, doc, I used to go to the gym, but I haven't gone in eight weeks, um, and so our own otherwise um, health can be somewhat um, affected, irritability, um, lack of motivation I, I hear about from a lot of folks. Um, and there are some folks who have slipped uh, or returned or increased their use of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Now, when we're looking at children um, more specifically, one thing I always have to pause and remind myself whenever we're doing these talks is to try to not pathologize um, everything that somebody uh, goes through. Uh, you know, there is normal sadness, there is normal worry, and that's, um, and that's just part of dealing with what life uh, throws at us. Most children will manage well um, with the support of their family, um, even if they show some signs of concern. So um, I do, I, it's important that we are vigilant, it's important that we do look out uh, for things, um, but to keep things in somewhat perspective. Now, some children, just like um, though, would be at higher risk um, of having more intense reactions dealing with uh, the stresses that we have. Of course, like I already mentioned, if, if 
the child uh, or minority had a pre-existing mental health uh, problem that uh, also, um, that of, of course put them more at risk. Uh, if they have a history of trauma or abuse, if there's been family instability or loss of a loved one, that just made things a lot more, um, uh, put them more at risk of struggling through um, the, this time. Now, as a parent or as a caregiver, uh, you know, you know your young one, you know what they're typically like, you know what their baseline um, is like. Uh, so you're the best judge of, of looking and trying to evaluate, uh, you know, how are they different? You know, there's some kids, let's say you had a teenager, and you know, he's, he slept 18 hours a day. That was a normal thing uh, uh, in the summer. That's just what he did. But if that wasn't your kid, uh, then, you know, that's something that's different for them. Um, so if you notice some, a significant change in, in their overall behavior and their overall mood, and again, this is not just one day, but something that's more consistent, at that point, we do try to see if, um, if you can reach out to, you can start off with, with your primary care, um, or if you have um, uh, already a relationship or folks that um, um, behavioral health uh, professionals that you um, know that, or, or try to reach out uh, for them. If you see a pattern that's different and concerning for your young one, that's lasting, you know, at least, you know, more than a couple of weeks. So it's not just uh, one day he, he um, you know, he was off. Now, everybody again does experience stress differently. I did put out some things um, and group them in different age groups. Uh, it, this is not an, an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but if you're looking at uh, some preschoolers, you may have some, um, uh, some young ones who may start reverting back to behaviors that they had outgrown, uh, for like thumb sucking, uh, toilet accidents or bedwetting, excessive crying. They're more clingy um, to parents or caretakers than they used to be. Uh, sleep disturbance, appetite disturbance. Now, new fears, um, like you know, being afraid of the dark, that wasn't an issue uh, that they had before. Um, and just general regression, um, or just going backwards as far as their behavior. It's, um, elementary or school kids, um, you may have some more physical complaints because if they don't have the language to let you, to explain to somebody that, oh, I am worried or I'm stressed, um, just this is even outside of a COVID situation. A lot of times um, you hear all about stomach aches, you hear about um, headaches because they, they can tell you, I don't feel right, even if they don't have the language uh, of, of an adult at first, oh, I'm anxious because that's just not part of the uh, vocabulary. You can have increased irritability, aggressiveness, some acting out um, um, behavior. Um, again, uh, they it can vary if things, they can also go to have, being more clingy, having nightmares. Um, I put in school avoidance, depending on, you know, what the school situation is uh, for, the, uh, for, uh, for the particular family. Uh, poor concentration, excessive worry, sadness, uh, withdrawing from activities and friends that they used to uh, be able to enjoy. That's, uh, when you're looking at the adolescents, um, again, sleeping and eating disturbance. And I left it vague because some folks, when they're stressed, eat more. Some folks eat less. Uh, some folks eat, um, sleep more. Some folks sleep less. But so you, you have to know your kid and what their baseline is and say, no, this is different um, than, their, the, than the way they usually are. And again, agitation, increased conflict, uh, just because you're just more on edge. Everybody's more snippy uh, and snapping uh, and just more irritable uh, overall. Again, just like with uh, slightly younger kids, physical complaints, delinquent uh, behavior, um, avoidance, uh, just like the uh, other group of forest activities that they would typically enjoyed in the past, um, and concentration problems. Now, what can we do uh, to support our, our young ones? Now, one of the things to remember is just in general, and not just in this COVID-19 situation, a lot of these things are actually um, uh, apply to uh, difficult or challenging situations just in general, is our children, they look to adults as far as guidance, as far as how to react in a stressful uh, situation. If you're, if you're, if they get the sense from you that yeah, this is bad, but I, we're, we're, we're okay, we, we got this, then they know they don't need to lose their, um, lose their head and lose their cool. Now, if if we're panicking, then they know, oh my goodness, dad's dad's losing it. Things were, must really be bad. Uh, but they look to us as far as. Um, guidance, essentially of how it is they should be handling uh, the situation. Now, 
what can we do? Take time to talk to your young one, regardless of age, and, you, and generally recommend um, to start by asking what it is that they know, because sometimes um, we can be wrong. We can assume that they know nothing, and we have to, um, um, you know, start them from scratch. While they actually have had conversations, um, you know, um, it, with their teachers or some friends or whatever, and they, so they have some baseline. Um, so you want to know where are they um, coming from? What information do they already have? And then that that presents an opportunity to correct any misinformation that you hear. Now that does uh, imply though that you have accurate information and listening to credible sources uh, yourself. Keep it simple as far as uh, being age, age appropriate for the uh, young one you're working with or where their intellectual um, uh, abilities um, are. And it's okay, even though we, yes, we're the adults, it's okay not to know, but try to keep the lines of uh, communication um, open. One of the things uh, for me that's also important is acknowledging feelings on both sides. One, be aware of your own feeling. If you're having one of those, my hair on is on fire moments, and you know that's when the questions are coming, that might not be the best time for you to have the, uh, the discussion. You might need to say, you know what, we'll, we will talk about this, um, but let me put myself in a good mental, uh, you know, give yourself a timeout, to, I'll get back to it, um, um, when you are better able to uh, deal with it. Uh, and acknowledge their feelings um, and avoid minimizing or dismissing because just like, yes, they do um, take their um, guidance essentially uh, from us, but the feelings that they have are real. Whether you f uh, think that their fears are unfounded, it, it doesn't change the fact that it's their feelings and we have to start uh, from there. Of and to offer some reassurance. Now, you know, that depending on the situation that you're dealing with, that yes, there are uh, people who are uh, uh, trying to work hard to make sure that uh, we stay safe. You know, um, mommy and daddy are doing what we can uh, to keep our family safe. You know, the teachers or school administrators are uh, putting plans in place to make sure that we stay safe. There, you know, there are people working on um, uh, vaccines and, um, and they're at the hospital making sure that they can take care of folks when they do get uh, just let them know that there are people working on this to try to make sure that we all uh, as a society uh, do the best that we can and this too shall pass at some point we don't know when um and, and it's not um but it's not going to be uh, the expectation is not going to be forever um and I put the other uh, bullet point first, let them know we can all fight germs. Essentially, one of the things that you, or one of the situations you don't want to be in is where you feel you have absolutely no control. You have absolutely no agency in what happens to you. You know, it's like, all right, so as a five year old, you know, you can be a germ busting superhero if you wash your hands uh, regularly. You know, you don't uh, sneeze um, uh, on, on your hands. Um, you know, there, there are things that you can do um, to make sure that you are safe, your family is safe, uh, because we, we, and we're not completely helpless. We have control. We, we, you can wear your mask that will keep you safe, that will keep grandma safe, that will keep. Um, you know, your teachers safe, they'll keep your pastor safe, that there, we all have a part that we can do. And we're not just um, drifting on this, um, on this sea of, uh, you know, badness, we have agency. Um, and having that really does shift your thinking, because you're not, you're not just a victim. It's like, I, I, I can't take ownership. And there are things I can, I can't control everything. But I can wash my hands. You know, I can make sure, um, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my distance. We can do that and that will help grandma. Uh, that will help your sister, that will help your mom. Um, this is what we can all can do. Um, I wanted to end with, of course, modeling uh, healthy habits and taking care of our body. Some of this was been uh, touched on already. But limiting screen times, it's somewhat this in, in two different contexts though. One, of course, yes, um, we, we all are, our kids are going to be, uh, have been, and going to uh, be remote uh, learning, so they're going to be on computers all the time. But just general, as far as uh, being mindful of that, um, uh, and how much time folks are spending um, uh, on the screens, but also for the adults. As far as yes, we do need to have uh, some information, but you do not need to have uh, the news uh, playing 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, you can pick your time. I'm going to get my information. I'm going to stay informed, and then you know push the pause button. You will, at the next 
24 hours. If you, if you do the six o'clock news, the next six o'clock news, they'll catch you up. Don't worry about it. Um, maintain a routine as much as possible. And this becomes really important for, uh, for the children um, uh, overall and ourselves, like my wife had mentioned earlier, but especially for the children, keeping as much normalcy as we can. Um, and hey. as you mentioned several times already as far as um, doing what we can it's, to keep ourselves healthy as far as- Dr. Dr. Mumpernier, you're about to wrap it up. Normal intervals, our regular exercise, getting out of the house, you know, if you're in a situation where you can, feel safe to, you know, to, to step out, just step outside um, uh, for a bit and, you know, take that walk if you can. Get Make sure you get plenty of sleep. And excuse me, Doc, excuse me, Dr. Sanders. Dr. Sanders, Sanders, can you hear me? Uh, because we do need to decompress um, um, and rejuvenate uh, overall. I'll, I'll stop there. I know I went way okay. over my time. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Very we much. Can... Thank you so Thank much. You so much. El Elder Smith. Yes, sir. Can, can I just uh, get a point of clarity? Somebody text me this. I think Dr. Berry, maybe you mentioned about animals. They want to know if you can get the disease from pets or from what you put on your dinner table. What kind of animals are you talking about? Well, according to the CDC, the COVID virus has been found in animals, but has not been known to be transmitted from animals to humans. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we do have about 45 minutes left, so we want to try to concise it. Uh, Dr. Grant, we know you got a wealth of information, sir, but we, we appreciate you um, kind of concise, concising it there for us. So I want to get to some of our questions. We have questions that are coming in. I'm going to uh, read them and... Um, they are, um, any, men on, any member of the panel can respond. We just ask you to try to concisely answer to about a minute or two uh, to each question if you wish to respond. First question comes from Zandra McRae. And uh, this question is, is this a man-made virus? See, I hear there is a patent on this virus. And once a person has had the virus, can they get it again? Is it a man-made virus? And once a person has had the virus, can they get it again? Anyone on the panel? Well, according to my understanding, the virus really comes from the bats. It was first in, uh, found in bats and transmitted to humans. When um, in, uh, Wuhan, China, they used to make bat soup and it was transferred this way. So um, it, it, there is some controversy about that about, because in Wuhan, China, there's also in a, a place where um, the Chinese make uh, chemical weapons. And so there's a big controversy here, but my understanding is it does, it was not man-made. It was um, um, come from bats to humans. And the second question, uh, that very good question, um, the jury is not out of that as yet. There has been one case published in um, Australia where a lady was positive for the COVID virus and got over it and got reinfected. Um, the question is, uh, this research, that maybe it was a misdiagnosis in the first place. So we're hoping that if you get the virus or get an injection, it'll last a lifetime, not like the flu virus, where you, it, 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 um, you have to get it every year. So the jury is not okay. All right. I wanted to add to that, yes, if I may. Um, in my opening remarks, I mentioned that uh, oh, since the 1970s, there's been 40 new viruses that have come about. And so COVID-19 is just the latest of a number of viruses. There have been over 40 different viruses. You remember just a few years ago, we were talking about the Zika virus. We talked about the MERS virus. We talked about SARS. We talked about Ebola, all these viruses. All that's happened with this one is that this one has spread around the world and has now become a, a pandemic. And um, it's led to a lot of concerns about uh, bioterrorism and these kinds of things and a lot of conspiracy theories. But as I've said before, these viruses, we know they're coming from animals for the most part. And so um, it is reasonable to assume that this virus came about like the others, like the Ebola virus, which was from apes or monkeys or, or from bats, those kinds of things and, and the consumption of these animals. And, but that's how these viruses, for the most part, are, are developing. They're being transmitted. They're jumping from one species to the other. Would you like to know how to kill the virus? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, yes, go right ahead. There, there are a number of ways to kill a virus. Remember, it's an RNA virus. Um, if you mix um, bleach, it, uh, one, one third cup of bleach in one gallon of water, that's five tablespoons of bleach, in one, um, in one gallon of water, you can use up to wipe down surfaces. Do not, 
do not in any way drink it or use it. Thank you. Food. Please. Thank you. No matter what anybody says, you do not ingest this. But if you mix five tablespoons of bleach in a third or a third cup of bleach and a gallon of water, you can use it to spray down items. That's number one. The second one is this. This is so important. God provides the sunlight. Sunlight kills the virus. Our schools should not be in rooms all day. Get outside, get into the sunlight, and get some ultraviolet light. There are three types of ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light um, A, B, and C. Ultraviolet light A is the one that does in tanning beds. Ultraviolet B is the one that gives you sunburns and skin cancer. Ultraviolet C is the one that's used to kill the virus. Now, I bought this. Can you see this? This is a little adapter that I put on my phone. And you, can you see? It sends out UVC light. I take this on my plane. When I travel in my planes, and if you put it on an item for 15 seconds, it will destroy the RNA in the virus and also part of the cell. Now, if you when I go to hotels, I carry this. This is a ultraviolet machine that when I put it on here, when I put it on, it sends out an ultraviolet light and I put it on my bed, my pillows, anything that in any hotel room that I go, I use this to take care of the um, virus, kills the virus because it destroys the RNA. And I got this for our school in the bathroom or in rooms that do not have a window. This is an item where it has a, a fan in here. You push it in a wall socket. It takes the air from inside. There's ultraviolet light in here. It makes it ultraviolet, killing whatever virus is there and sends out fresh air. All of these are important in killing the virus. Now, if you can't kill the virus, what we have found out that the body itself, the virus doesn't kill you directly. You know that, right? The virus does not kill you directly. What it does, it sets up in, uh, inflammation in the lungs or the heart or the kidneys, and that's what kills you. So according to National Institute of Health, the way for you to help yourself is to strengthen your immune system by taking vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin B, and zinc. These are all antioxidants that activate the T cells of the body and help fight off infection. So becoming a vegetarian, I believe there'll be a study coming up in the in in next uh, 12 months that shows that being a vegetarian may be beneficial to you in taking care of the virus because it equips your immune system with these antioxidants to get rid of all these free radicals. All right, all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Next question from Odella Thompson says, what are the most effective masks for the common person to wear during this pandemic? Which masks are the most effective to wear during this pandemic? Dr. Dr. Wallace? Okay. No, no, go ahead. No. Uh, Dr. Grant, you want to weigh in first? No, I can. But uh, I don't think everybody has access to N95 masks. That's probably the best one. However, you need some, you you don't want to go with a thick uh, a thin mask. The thickest that you can uh, come up with, maybe two layers or even three, uh, for everyday common use. That's what I would I would recommend. Uh, at one time, I was wearing two masks in the operating room. I was wearing an N95 and a surgical mask. Yeah. This one is so uncomfortable. It's an N95, but it's very uncomfortable. I started using this one that has valves, and I found out that this is very good for me, mm -hmm. too, because yeah. it um, filter out the um, air when I breathe it in, but the valve opens them and sets out my air into the mm -hmm. environment. I have COVID-19, then you are around to get it. So this is not good. So the best thing is also the surgical mask that you, you can get. The problem is that you got to make sure it fits over your face. And this is important. If I wear this mask and I touch it, I have just, in, remember, the mask is preventing the virus from going in. So where's the virus? The virus is on the surface of the mask. If I touch the mask to fix it, to adjust it, my hand now just con got contaminated. So I need it. Every time I touch my mask, I got to wash my hands just by touching the mask. That's why I'm concerned about masks with children because they're going to be touching this all, over the, all the time. And therefore, they need to have sand sanitizer, something to wash their hands. But by just touching it, and then rubbing your neck, you just contaminated yourself. Okay. Dr. Wallace, I see you want to respond. Unmute yourself, please, sir. I just wanted to say that a mask is better than no mask. 
at all. And um, a face covering that at least covers the nose and the mouth is, uh, is best of, of any kind there. It's better than not having anything all, but certainly the surgical mask is, is the best mask. But uh, seeing people with this mask and it's hanging down um, past their nose or on their chin, that is not going to help at all. It has to be covering both the nose and the mouth. My, my mask says KN95. Is that a knockoff? Is that a, is that KN95? Does that work? Uh, it does. The, okay. the, uh, the N means not resistant to oil. That's all it means. N is not resistant to oil. But if you have 95, remember, it is so, the, the holes in this are 0 0.05 if it's 95. Therefore, any, any virus or uh, any organisms that's bigger than that, 95% of it will not get through. Just 95%. So you're all right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Our next question, Elder Winston, I think this one you might be able to start off with, and if others want to weigh in on it. This question comes from Elder Calvin Preston. It says, if I belong to a small church that is able to social distance, why can't our church open? Elder Winston. Well, there, there, there are two or three reasons. And thank you, Elder Preston, for that question. Um, we, we, have, we have a spiritual mandate from the church. That's the first thing. We have a spiritual mandate from the Lord to, to prepare people for the soon coming. But as a conference, we also have a health mandate, which is why we're having this forum today, to make sure we keep people healthy. And we also have a legal responsibility. Um, we have to make sure that what we practice, we practice um, universally. We can, we, can, we can make sure that we show people that when we went to our churches, they took temperatures, they wore masks. And, and until we feel comfortable that all of the churches can open, uh, we don't know if 170 churches are taking temp. We don't know if they have hand wash. We don't know if everyone wears masks. We don't know if they followed what we told them and not have a choir. So in order to make sure that we, we are on the same page, we say we open the churches up when we are comfortable that this has, the worst of it has passed and we can protect and we can, and we can make sure we have documentation that we have that. That's one of the things about school. There's, there's a, a list, a check sheet that all of the schools have to do in order to open up on Monday. Uh, but we have to have some documentation because there are legal ramifications to opening up churches and schools. And we have to make sure that we cover ourselves and protect uh, not just our health and well being, but protect this church from liability. That's the short answer. I wanted to. Oh. Can I jump in here for just a second? Yes. Um, I just wanted to add that um, we and we've already hinted at this already, but I've seen some statistics. Um, African Americans, the African American population, being about three times more likely to get COVID, and some have said as much as six times more likely to die from from COVID nineteen. So African American is a high risk population. When you're dealing with a high risk population, you can't behave like the majority of the other people. You have to take extra and be special precautions. And so we are a high risk uh, population. And so, you know, we should be the last people who want to run back to the, to the movie theater. Uh, we should be the last people who want to run back to a bowling alley because we are a high risk population. And I would back to say that probably everybody listening and showing this knows at least somebody who's had the virus. If not, they've not had the virus themselves. But we are touched by this virus in a way that others of the population aren't. And so we have to take extra precautions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I have a comment if, if there's enough time. Sure, go right ahead. Okay, what I would add to what Dr. what Pastor Winston mentioned was establishing a protocol. I helped to do this at my grandson's private school in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, when the pastor alluded to records, that was one of the main things I impressed upon as principal. You establish a protocol, you follow that protocol, and you keep records to document that you have followed that protocol. It's. I think we just lost him. He froze. Okay. 
All right, I'll, I'll move to, to another question. It's another question that, that comes to mind, and this is uh, perhaps um, uh, Dr. Mom Premier and Dr. Mom Premier you can help us with this right here. If someone is sick and in quarantine, you know, they've been they've tested positive and they are sick as a result of the virus. You may have answered this some in your slide presentation. What um, counsel could you give them to maintain good mental health as they try to recover? I'll take that. Um, one of the things we want to make sure is that people are staying connected. And so, you know, we are blessed to at least have experienced this pandemic in an age where we can connect through these things. <laughs> and so I would encourage um, people to video chat and, um, and make voice calls and do as much as possible to stay connected um, so that you're not feeling like you're just stuck alone. Make sure that um, there's someone who can, you know, fly through the door, this and that or whatever, um, so that if you have some needs, you can text them and say, hey, I'm running out of this or that and such. Um, but just make sure that you stay connected. You can even play a game of, you know, they have all kinds of games that you can play uh, um, through Zoom or whatever, but make sure that you're staying connected because as the more you're in the room by yourself, the more you're stuck in your head and the worries get to getting worse and worse and, and your stress level goes up, which means your cortisol goes up, which means you're at more risk for those, the depression and anxiety that might come, especially if we're at higher risk for depression and anxiety. And a lot of us are, I mean, you know, why wouldn't it be? We are, what, four or five generations from slaves? And I'm sure they had reason to be depressed and anxious. <laughs> and so that stuff gets passed down genetically. Um, so we wanna make sure that we take good care of our brain and most of all take good care of our stress level so I say make sure that as much as possible and in addition to what you're eating um, my brother already talked about um, the inflammation you want to make sure you're doing that anti-inflammation diet so that you know you can get through that coronavirus quickly Ella Smith, can we get the, the other part of Dr. Grant? I think it's very important, especially with school opening Monday, uh, if he could finish what he was saying before. But yeah, Dr. Grant, your screen froze up on us. So uh, okay. yeah. Yeah, the last part of what you were saying. Okay, what I was saying is we need to establish a protocol. We need to follow that protocol. And we need to keep records of that protocol. That becomes of paramount importance when and if we need contact test. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sanyas Monpari, did you want to add anything to what your wife said about keeping good mental health? If you are sick, you've been diagnosed with it and you're trying to recover. So, sorry. Um, other physicians had mentioned um, back in March was, you know, we talked a lot about social um, distancing. His preferred term though is not social distancing, but physical distancing. Because we are social, we are social creatures. Yes, we have to be, we have to be physically um, apart for our health uh, and safety, but not to neglect our, uh, our social part, the social part of ourselves. Um, so one, um, you know, if you, as for everybody to try to reach out to the folks that they have not heard um, uh, from. And if you yourself um, are in a situation where, okay, you, you're, you're not able to go out for um, either because you're not quarantined, for you to make sure that you do what you can to reach out. My, my wife mentioned uh, the phone, but there's a computer um, that we're doing this um, conference call um, on. Um, and if some, somebody, if they're at a point where they do need professional help, I know for me, I've been seeing 
probably 98% of uh, all patient appointments were done virtually. Um, so it's still okay to um, try to reach out for professional help because you can, that we've, everybody shifted overnight. You know, I was told that uh, before in my job, there's no way we'd be able to work from, uh, work from home. But as soon as this started somehow, miraculously, we can all work from home now. Um, but, because what you also don't want is, because there's been too many, I've heard of too many anecdotal uh, stories where people have had uh, either mental health or other physical health concerns and have avoided seeking help, have avoided getting the help that they need. So we have folks with strokes sitting at home because they didn't want to go to uh, the hospital because they might get coronavirus. Like, well, um, that's not good either. So bottom line is you can still reach out um, uh, yourself uh, to uh, to others if there's a need, and for us to just remember our neighbor, for us to remember our pew uh, our pew partners um, uh, at church, and be proactive in reaching out to folks. In addition to doing everything that we can um, to um, keep ourselves as healthy, both physically and emotionally. Okay, thank you, thank you. Next question comes from Elder Brown: Will a vaccine be effective in addressing the virus? since there are so many various strands. Will a vaccine be effective in addressing the virus since there are so many various strands? Well, at this point here, there, there's just one strain of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so there, there are different COVID viruses. There's the SARS, the uh, MERS, and there are eight different um, coronaviruses. But the one we're looking for is the SARS-CoV-2. That is the one they're trying to get um, a, a um, vaccine for. Russians said they have it. So we are doing um, phase three trials. We need at least 19,000 individuals to um, get um, the injection, get infected, and go through the process. I don't think it's going to be ready until maybe um, um, late uh, after the winter for, for the United States. Now, Russia ha says they have a vaccine and they offered it to the United States. The United States they didn't want it because I think it, they went too quickly because um, it, it takes sometimes four years really to get a, a vaccine out. And we've been doing this in the next, in the last six to eight months. So um, there's only one virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we're trying to get a vaccine for. That's my understanding right now. All right. Okay. All right, the next one is... Can I, can I piggyback on that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what, what about the what's being said about that people won't go to get tested because they're putting chips in us and, and they're doing all of those. What, what kind of, what do you say about that for people who just are afraid that there's some kind of espionage? Well, remember, Pat, we must believe everything that we see on Facebook, everything. Yes. It is... It, journal that we must listen to and listen to everything they say there. Um, I have had no evidence um, in the literature that I've reviewed of, of, of that. So, uh, um, so I even if even if some of those who have uh, have promoted these things are Adventists, we shouldn't believe? Uh, as I said, um, you, you, Facebook is something you have to decide whether you, you should research it out. As far as I'm concerned, the research I have read says nothing of that. Not just wanted, if I can add to that, oh, go ahead. if I could just add to that, yeah, there's there's a lot of conspiracy uh, theories floating around about uh, the, the, uh, this uh, vaccine, um, and and we we have to be honest that you know there are concerns. I mean, there 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 are legitimate concerns. Um, I, I personally have a problem with the vaccine called warp speed because a vaccine needs to be safe first. <laughs> needs to be effective before you start talking about warp speed. And, you know, the Russian vaccine, I mean, that is that is too quick. I mean, and, and my understanding is they skipped a lot of the trials that normally we would have gone through, the steps that we would have gone through. And that's all to document the safety before we give this uh, vaccine out. What I, what I see happening is the vaccine being available uh, sometime next year, probably the earlier part of next year, but um, e even for those who want it, it's going to be a problem giving it to the people that, uh, that need it. And then, you know, my experience with vaccines, vaccines aren't 100%. Um, and, and, and that's a concern because in America, I know when people get the vaccine, they're going to consider themselves bulletproof. 
And um, that is a concern. The safety is gonna be a concern and getting it to the minority populations will be a concern as well because um, one, selling it to the minority population because there's gonna be hesitancy, which, which, which is understandable. But even for the people who want it, there's gonna be some concern. So, you know, all this stuff with the vaccine, uh, I mean, it's coming and eventually it will be of some effect, but, but we got a bumpy road ahead. And so again, we're back to our health message and doing the things which we can to put ourselves in the best health, at least for the foreseeable future. And I would- and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop breaking in, but Dr. Barry, where can I get this light? And maybe you should text me privately. I don't want everybody else jumping on Amazon before I can get on at sunset, but where, where do I get that from? Yeah, but two things. We need to get the flu vaccine this year. Don't forget, you have to get the flu vaccine this year because it's, um, there's going to be a um, the COVID-19 and flu vaccine around the end of the year. It's going to be devastating. So I'm advising everyone to get a flu vaccine. So that this is, as I said, you got this on Amazon. It's, uh, it's called UVC sterilizer, UVC sterilizer. And it adds on to any I iPhone or any Android. You can make sure you choose which one you want, Android, UVC. No, there's different UV, UVC, and as I said, it's very difficult to carry in a plane, but it's small. This other one here, I carry with me also when I go to the hotels. And this one um, is, um, you get it, so just go and look for um, ultraviolet light um, on, on um, Amazon after Sabbath, and you can get it. This one, the, the, the conference, the South Atlantic Conference gave our schools $2,000 to equip our schools for, um, for the COVID-19. And we use some of that funds to buy this for the bathrooms, the two male and female bathrooms and the classrooms where it has a fan in here that, that circulates air in, it, uh, sterilizes it and, and sends it out. It's, it's the least we can do, but get out in the sunlight. That's the best thing we can do. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, the, once again, the, the phone number, if you have a question, you want to text it in. We have about 20 minutes or so left. Uh, it's 678-434-0343. I believe it's on the screen there with me. 678-434-0343. Here's the next question, and here's something I haven't heard of, and maybe some of you have. Explain herd immunity. Now, I don't know what that is, but uh, maybe some of you do. But explain herd immunity. Anyone want to weigh in? Do you want to go? Herd immunity is when a number of individuals in a community get the virus and the virus will no longer be, um, be infected to other people because all the people in the community have gotten it. Remember, 80% of people who get the virus do fine. They don't even know they have it. 15%, um, uh, they'll get a little sick and uh, they might not feel well. They think they have the flu or something. And 2% of the population who get it will get into the ICU and have to put in a ventilator. So herd immunity is where you can either get at people, get the, um, the, 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 the vaccine out to the community, a number of individuals in the community or have them spread it in the community. That's what they did in, um, I believe it was um, uh, Sweden. Sweden, they didn't have a vaccine. So they said, just spread it so that everybody will get it. No one will be able to, um, to, um, to people will die, but it'll be, it's, it's a herd, um, like, like how it's being, um, being um, what branded. Then if everyone gets it, then the virus won't be able to survive. It's not the best way to beat the virus, by the way. I would think not. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wanted to yeah. add to that. Oh, can I add to that a little bit? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, because you know, e even now in this country, there's a lot of people that are, are kind of pushing for, for that. And um, particularly business people and people that just say, hey, let's just get on with our lives, that kind of thing. And uh, let's just let the virus run and then let's see whatever it does, it does. And, um, you know, that's just not acceptable because we're still looking at potentially 1% of the population dying from this virus. I mean, when all is said and done. So over, over a population of 300 some million, are, are you accepting the fact that 3 million people will just die and will just sort of move on? And it's amazing as it sounds, but I've, I've 
encounter some people who say, yeah, let's just, just go ahead and do it because business needs to go on. But that's just simply just not acceptable. That is not acceptable. And that's why we're taking these precautions. That's why we're doing these things because we're trying to save lives. And the mask and these kinds of things, it can reduce and it can actually save lives. But herd immunity is an approach. I mean, you know, a few hundred years ago when we didn't have anything else, uh, that, that might have been acceptable, but no, not in the United States. For three million people to accept the lives of three million people, and then, like I said, it's disproportionate. There are populations that will be affected far more than other populations. The minority populations would be hit far more than other populations if we practice this type of thing. Dr. Sanders Montpernier, yeah, thank you, you had a comment? Yeah, so with the concept of herd immunity also works from the other side of the equation. And so let's say you have, um, you know, we have right now chickenpox vaccines, we have, um, you know, flu vaccines, we have all these other vaccines. Um, and we've had diseases that we've had in this country under control because most people got a vac vaccine and were immune. But you guys may have heard recently that there's been outbreaks of like measles and other diseases that really weren't um, an issue because we've had people who have been against vaccines for a while and chosen to not vaccinate either themselves for some whatever reason. Um, and But if, let's say, if you, if you have a classroom and 99% um, of the kids are um, vaccinated against uh, measles, right? Um, then now the chances that you're going to have a spread of measles in that classroom is very low because there's only 1% of the kids who even can get it. Right. And so it, what, what we've had start happening as parents stop vaccinating um, their kids. Um, now you have bigger, you have a smaller, a larger percentage of folks who aren't are not vaccinated. So now these diseases that we've had under control, um, if somebody comes in from somewhere and they have they carry their carry their measles or, or whatever with them now, because a lower percentage of people are immune, now you can have another outbreak. So that so that's the other equation or other side of the equation when you're dealing with herd immunity. Um, it's, it's, we're gonna have, have the discussion when there's a vaccine available because how many people do you, what percentage of people do you need vaccinated to actually have this be um, to get this under control? It's not just having a vaccine, but okay, do you have an effective vaccine? How effective is it? And how what percentage of the population is actually vaccinated? Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, this next question, uh, and Dr. Grant, I think I'll start with you. I think you touched on this during your opening remarks. Why are African-Americans, why are African-Americans dying at a faster rate? And what is the main cause of hospitalization? I think you touched on that during your opening statements. Why are African-Americans dying at a faster rate from this, this, this disease? Because of comorbidities. There are people uh, within the... African American population that have hypertension, diabetes, uh, morbid obesity, mild obesity, kidney disease. These things become exacerbated <clears throat> with the inflammation that's caused by the coronavirus. These things are, I look at it from a very personal level. We will. Uh, if we get a stain on our rug the next day, we got the carpet man coming in to clean it. If uh, there's something wrong with our car, it's going to the shop. But so often we neglect ourselves. Uh, we do need to get off the couch. We do need to exercise. We do need to practice the eight health principles. We do need to watch our diet. We do need to get out in the sunlight. We need to exercise, drink an appropriate amount of water. These kinds of things I've are simple, but they are effective. However, with the comorbidities, the other diseases that we have, it predisposes us to being more susceptible. When we get it, it's worse for us because we have something else in addition to the coronavirus. Okay. And I think there's other things um, that go along with that. So if you're a population that um, had lower income um, and less likely to have easy access to healthcare, or if you did have healthcare, you were in a position, in a job or a position where, you know, taking that day off, um, you know, uh, came at a, at a great cost. Um, so you have a lot of pop a population that was more at risk of, and just 
the basic things of taking care of yourself have become more difficult. Uh, and then couple that with, if you're the population that was deemed to be essential workers, low paid people who could not do your work, your job remotely. So you had to be out there in the front lines, um, exposing yourself. So that just created a bad storm. Um, one, you had, you had the comorbidities to, to begin with and you didn't have the option to remote work. So if, you, if you're gonna take care of your family, you had to be out there or, you know, or once things started opening, opening back up, you know, your boss called you, you had to be back out there. So that just created the perfect storm. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I see one question down here, and I think, Mr. President, you touched on it before, but nevertheless, I'll read. This is from Tanya Moody. If bars and restaurants are open, why can't churches open? <laughs> it was there, so I read it. <laughs> good, good answer, because people in bars and restaurants do not follow science. Uh, they, they are not on the for the most part, uh, God-fearing people. And uh, I see some of those people that are shaking their fist in God's face and just daring, just daring God. Um, we, we have a responsibility to protect uh, those who, whom God has put in our care. Uh, I don't want to hear any person in the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, because we opened the church early and they decide to go back to the church who, who gets COVID and certainly not someone can lose their life. Um, God has blessed us. You all, you, the, the saints of God have been incredibly faithful with their giving. Um, in fact, we had one of our regional conferences that had a million dollar tithe gain last month. It is, an, it is incredible how, how faithful you have been with your giving. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it helps our churches. It helps uh, those who work for the church. Uh, it helps us to continue to do the, 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 the message of God. What we're doing now, I had to learn. I had to get used to this, this uh, virtual. But every day, except for uh, Sabbath uh, and, and a half a day Friday, I'm on five or six Zoom conferences every day. That's, that's my life. Um, and, and we're going to be doing it for the foreseeable future. We have made a decision uh, administratively in the conference that we're not going to open churches this month and probably not next month. It may be early October before we start opening churches. And uh, I think the other thing is that the saints of God will determine themselves. As, as Clark Howard would say, uh, vote with your feet and vote with your wallet. I think most people are going to decide when they're going back to church on their own. They're not waiting for me to tell them. They're going to decide when they want to go back to church. And I think that's a good thing. But when we believe it's safe, we'll open the churches. And right now, that looks to be maybe early October, unless the fall wave comes. Unless when cold weather comes, this thing flares up again. So, so we won't make any decisions. We, we'll tell you not this month and probably not September. Um, I, I do have a question since you all gave me the mic. What, what, what if I find out that I am exposed? I've been around someone who has the virus, who's tested positive. What, what, what should I do? Um, if I could just jump in here, um, because first, first they're talking about yeah, people in bars and these kinds of things. We're, we're seeing, we are seeing the consequences of, of, of improper behavior. I mean, we're, we're seeing them. I mean, uh, um, when I saw those schools open in Georgia and there was no social distancing and there's no mask, there were going to be consequences. And you can look at that and say, wow, they're doing that? That's strange. But let, make no mistake, there are consequences when you're not following these guidelines. You may not live or may hear about it, but there are consequences. I've seen some of these people that were in these bars that they came and they, and they tested positive for COVID. So make no mistake, if you're not practicing these guidelines, you're going to see the, uh, the, the consequences of that. And then as for you know, being, being around somebody who, who's, who's, who's positive for COVID, understand again, I mean, if you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask, um, you, you, you are, you're reducing that risk. Now, the longer you're around them, 
And even with a mask, you're, you're, you know, the, the risk kind of goes up. But if you physically, and, and I should say this, and, I, and I, I know it sounds depressing, but this virus is so prevalent that I predict that before this is over, I think most of us are going to be exposed to it at some point. We're gonna, it's, it's just that prevalent. And that's why the wearing of the mask makes such a difference. Because if you're wearing the mask, I'm wearing the mask, and we keep that mask on all the time with our interactions, we're reducing that risk of transmission. But if you've been if you've been around somebody, particularly that person, because I see this all the time, you're talking to them, what are you saying? And mm, put off that mask. I said, <laughs> and they're talking like this in your face. Then guess what? Uh, that 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 definitely is is a risk. And if you've been exposed like that, you should. You really should be tested because you don't know if if you because as we know, you could have the virus and not have any symptoms. It takes eight. 14 days for um, the virus to manifest itself. Yes. So if you're somebody who has fevers, coughs, sore throat, headaches, shortness of breath, and a loss of smell, and they speak to you and, uh, and, uh, and it comes out and you get in, you're around them and they're positive, that's what I like to know. Did your barber have a mask on when he took care of you, Pastor? That's the way to do. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, we're both, yes. Now, let me, let me ask you, you muted, are you muted or am I muted? Can't hear you, Dr. Barry. So, if somebody has symptoms, fevers, coughs, sore throat, headaches, shortness of breath, loss of smell, and then they're around you, they're, they're positive, it takes eight to 14 days for you to develop your symptoms. That's why you go home and stay home for those 14 days. If you develop any of those symptoms and you go to the emergency room and be tested, some hospitals do not test them if they've been exposed. They test them if they have the symptoms of, um, of the... Um, one of my patients last week, the only symptom she had was a headache. She had a headache for three days. That's all she had. She had no fevers, nothing else. I sent her to the emergency room because I had a great suspicion of that it was um, COVID. They, she tested positive, but she went home and she's there for the 14 days. People bring her food, do her shopping. She cannot leave the home. And I, I know time uh, time is running out. What, what about those ACE receptors? You tried to get us on that. Can, can you briefly do that? An ACE receptor, it's an ACE2 receptor. The virus grabs onto the ACE2 receptor and opens up the cell and the RNA goes into the cell and causes that. Now, many people are on ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are blood pressure um, um, medications that in a sense suppress this. And there was a study initially that said that maybe the people who, have, who are ACE inhibitors are at an advantage to die because of the COVID virus. Well, the Annals of Internal Medicine came up with a study in May of 2020 that shows that that's not the case. So do not stop taking your ACE inhibitors for your high blood pressure. Another study came out by in, in uh, at Atlanta by, I think, um, no, not Atlanta. It was um, Huntsville in Alabama, University of Alabama, that showed that people who are on the blood sugar medication, metformin seems to do better with the um, less deaths from people who had the COVID virus. Metformin is a medication that you take for um, diabetes. And people who are on that, according to this study here, the 70% of the people who are on this medication did not suffer the, um, the, the death and the intubation uh, than people who were not on it. So that's a new study that came out just recently about metformin. So do not stop any medication. Do not start anything unless you speak to your doctor first because there are new things coming out. What I say today may not be the same in one month. So speak to your doctor who should be up to date. When the COVID virus started, people went to the toilet paper part of, the, of, the, of, of Walmart. I don't know why. Yeah. I fruit section. I got yes, There you go strawberries, I got yes. um, grapes, I got all these fruit, because that's the high antioxidants that I need to, to, to take care mm -hmm. of the free. That's where I went. And every mm -hmm. morning, day, I take a handful of blueberries or blackberries to help my immune there system. Yes, I agree. I mean, people should have been running for kale and blueberries, not running for toilet paper. It made no sense to me. You know, the other thing I, I want to say is, come, all these patients are coming in wanting to know their blood type all of a sudden. And um, I've been, I, I didn't recognize that until later that there's some evidence out there or a research suggesting that your blood type can be protective or, or destructive. But that research, is, as, as far as I've read, is not conclusive. It, there's, there's nothing conclusive about that. But everybody wants to know their blood type because somehow they think they might be protected or they may be at risk. But the evidence for that is just not conclusive at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're just about out of time, but I think it's important. I just received a, a comment uh, that will clear some things, maybe a disclaimer. Mr. President, the question about the bars opening, 
Tanya Moody did not uh -huh. send in that question. Maybe it was another Tanya Moody somewhere else or someone else sent it in in her name. So I just received a note that, you know, Tanya Moody did not send in the question about the bar's opening. So I thought I'd let you know that, Mr. President. I, I, I needed to hear that because I've been disturbed ever since I heard that question. Well, she sent a note up saying she did not send in that question. Someone may have sent it in in her name, but she did not send in that question, Mr. President. <laughs> Our time is pretty much about gone, and this uh, we could go on and on with this, because this is very good, very helpful. I want to express appreciation to all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Barry, North Carolina, Dr. Richard Barry from South Carolina, Dr. David Grant, and from Georgia, Dr. Tracy Wallace, and our two persons in the mental health field, Dr. La Nina Mompronye and Dr. Sanders Mompronye. We thank you all for taking some time out to share the knowledge and wisdom with us. It's been very helpful, very beneficial. I have learned, and I'm sure that others who have tuned in have learned as well. So right now I'm going to invite Elder Winston to give some closing marks and Elder D.M. Jones to give some closing marks and give us our closing prayer. Mr. President. And, and mine will be brief because I would like one of the doctors to have a parting shot here. Um, Sabbath afternoons are pretty much like this every Sabbath. Uh, we can do this again. If you feel a need for it, you can just kind of send in a word to us uh, from a conference or, or give us a suggestion as to something you would like for us to cover. Uh, I was asked uh, by a person, don't call it town hall because it sounds political and other things. Well, uh, whatever you want to call it, we're going to do this because it, the information needs to go out. So I, I will yield my time to one of the, the physicians who would like to have the parting word uh, from a medical standpoint. Uh, Dr. Wallace, Dr. Baird, Dr. Grant, Dr. Uh, anybody want to take the last word? Well, I, I would just say that um, we still have a ways to go with this virus. Uh, we still have a ways to go with this virus. And I know people are getting tired of, of this, of all this, the mask and the distancing and the sanitizer and all this, but well, we still have a ways to go and uh, this is not a time to get tired and, and we have still some rough times ahead of us, but uh, God will see us through. I mean, God will definitely see us through and it's no accident that 150 years ago we were giving a message of health that is actually more relevant to us today with COVID-19, with coronavirus, that message of health is more relevant to us today than even when it was given 150 years ago. God has equipped us with what we need to do. And if never before, if never before, if you've looked at this message of health and said, ah, whatever, now is the time. Now is the time to embrace that message, read that message and start to live that message of health. And then you just leave, leave the rest in God's hands and he will see us through. Thank you. Yes. Before we go to Elder Jones, thank you. With the uh, last uh, parting word in prayer, I just reminded by our Vice President of Education, Mrs. Kim Gator, um, Monday, some of our schools in this conference will open. And what we're doing, some of our smaller schools who are able to social distance and practice all of the other uh, safety features will open on Monday. Our larger schools, because there's less ability to social distance and practice the other safety features, will continue distance learning. So we invite you to pray, continue to pray for uh, all of our schools, you know, particularly those small ones that will be opening that we can keep our children as safe as possible. So please, please pray, pray for our schools. Elder Jones. Yes, I want to express my appreciation to the doctors for your wisdom in sharing it with us. I want to thank our president for permitting this to happen today. And maybe again, we could have something like this. We've been enlightened. Thank you so much. May the Lord bless, shall we pray. Father in heaven, be with us as we go through this crisis in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I don't know. I hope we're not live on the air, are we?
thank you all very much. This this was awesome, and I'm sure we'll do it again. Uh, invaluable, invaluable. Thank you very much.